that will have to be worked fast because we're shooting these before. That's right. I understand that. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Environment Sustainability Committee meeting for Wednesday, September the 21st, the year 2022. Um, first order of business is the open session. Call the meeting to order. Declarations of conflict of interest. None. Uh, approval of agenda. I would like to add um, the order of update on bus shelters and status report on the new bus routes. Might as well throw another item on there too, is uh, Actor for Transportation Pathway. Thank you. Well, we're gonna go through it as quick as we can, Councilor Rivard. Um, okay, so approval of agenda, approval of minutes. First, okay, thank you. Business arising from the minutes. Okay, reports and discussions, item A, transit fuel subsidy. Jessica, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So every year the city budgets for fuel subsidy for T3 and for this fiscal year we budgeted $88,000 and our first quarter invoice came in at $76,079. And uh, so that relates to our agreement with T3 that's valid until 2025, which says that we pay 75% of IRAC posted fuel prices above $1.10 a liter. So good news with transit is ridership is up and there are tons of people on transit but the bad news is, is that fuel prices are really high and we're burning mule, more fuel getting the buses around the city. So this report is to notify you of that and request that we shuffle a couple of operating dollars around. So what I suggest is to uh, continue to pay Trias fuel subsidy invoices. We increase the transit operating budget by $140,000 and then 40,000 transferred um, from environment and sustainability and, and transit operating um, into that as well. Um, that is a ballpark number based on, we obviously don't know what's gonna happen with fuel prices, so that's, that's ballpark. I, su I suspect it'll be less than that uh, with fuel, fuel prices going down compared to what they were in the first quarter. And that is it. Uh, floor is open for questions. Do we move this to finance then? Is that what the process is? Yeah, we have a contract, we have to pay, and we don't control the price of fuel, so let's move it to finance. I, I have a couple of questions. Um, I think you gave us the breakdown on our partnership with uh, Stratford. I believe Cornwall's included as well. Okay, so our share of the equation is 75%, correct? Uh, CAO Donna, I think in future we need to, uh, I would like to see that renegotiated because ridership is increasing. I would suggest that they're going to be looking at uh, additional bus routes as well in their respective municipalities. So, you know, it was great that we use this formula to get this uh, this program off the ground a number of years ago. And of course, you were instrumental when, uh, when we started the, or the in, in, introduction of the uh, transit system here in the city of Charlottetown. But I do believe we need to revisit the formula. That's point number one. And point number two, Jessica, uh, we are anticipated the arrival of the electric buses. Is that for the year 2023 or 2024? 
I don't know that. So Ramona kept the capital purchase portfolio for transit. So I don't know the timelines on that. I would have to get back to you. I'm, I'm going to go go to Don. I think it's, it's either 20, I think it's late fall of 2024, maybe early spring, early 2025. That's when we'll be prepared to accept the, the electric buses and when they'll be ready. And that'll be a, a total changeover. No, no, we will still have some diesel buses um, because the funding wasn't there at the time for a whole electric fleet, a whole new electric fleet. But the, the majority of buses will be electric, but we will still have some diesel substituting in and out. Um, and then we will, we are hopeful of another program that we will be able to get, finish off the fleet. And, that, and you're anticipating the year 2024, okay? And then, Donna, on the formula, can you please make a note of that? I, I do believe that, you know, we need to revisit the formula. The whole contract, Mr. Chair, will be is up in 2025, given the changes that we're going through, um, and we will be going through. We will be opening the contract a little bit, um, but <clears throat> we the whole the whole contract will be reviewed in 2025. 2024, 2025, 25. when that's what it's up, it was signed in 2005, 2015, and, and now 2025, it will be, it's up for a 10-year renewal for, for up to 30 years is the way we have it set up, and believe it or not, 2025 will be 20 years we've been running buses in Charlottetown, um, and uh, um, so the the whole the whole contract will be opened at that time, and at, and that and that time we hope to have the we'll have the electric buses, we'll have all of the we'll we'll be starting a new at a new place. We consider trying to open the contract now, but uh, we looked at it and, and we took advice, legal advice that it, you know do what you have to do, particularly with things like the, these like new new routes and and the fuel subsidy and that type of thing. But uh, so we'll probably be coming to you. We'll probably be coming to you again be f sooner rather than later on new routes because we've got so many more service hours. I guess is what I'm saying more service hours. Um, not to prolong the discussion, but uh, there's no way we can improvise. There's no uh, clause in the contract that would enable or give the opportunity for the city to. Uh, even renegotiate that formula uh, just to go in and, The formula and between the three municipalities? I don't know why you would think that we should renegotiate that. I mean, we take the full price, and, and, I, and I say this with all due respect, we take the full price, we pay 75, 15, to 15 and 10. And, and I think if you looked at it, uh, the ridership is probably split fairly nicely like that. It certainly was, and, and we can have a look at that to have a look and see what the, to see. Um, but they pay, they pay for their service hours. We pay for our service hours. Um, the buses, we pay 75, 15, 10, the, the, the capital type of thing. But they pay for their service hours on their own. If they want to increase their service hours, they can increase them. That's how we're paying by service hours. The city of Charlottetown has... I forget how many service hours we have, um, uh, uh, and they have X number of service hours, uh, each of them, and they pay their co their costs. So if they want to increase their routes by a whole lot, Mike, and we have the buses and, and whatever, that they can do that. Okay, so it has no that impact and no, effect on our on no. our bottom line from a financial perspective. From an operating perspective, Operation. no. Okay. Thank you. Item B, Public E Bike Program, Sophie. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, thanks, sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so the objectives of this program would be to provide a sustainable, cost-efficient, and healthy transportation option, elevate downtown business traffic, and reduce parking and traffic co congestion. This program aligns with this, the goals from the City of Charlottetown's Integrated Community Sustainability Plan. 
E-bike shares have been tried in other jurisdictions and the results of those trials were positive. In the city of Brighton, in the United Kingdom, 80 employees were loaned an e-bike for a six to eight week period. Of these people, three quarters used the bikes at least once a week and average usage across the whole sample was 15 to 20 miles per week. There was an overall reduction in car mileage of 20% and at least 70% said that they would like to have an e-bike available for use in the future and would cycle more if this was the case. We're suggesting docking stations be dispersed throughout Stratford and Charlottetown. In my research, I determined that e-bike shares are used the most when docking stations are walking distances apart. That's why I have suggested 300 to 450 meters apart. Um, different pass options will be available for purchase through the website and the app. Secondary locks will allow users to make stops along the way and operations including maintenance, rebalancing, customer service, and IT will be handled by the supplier or a third party organized or operator. Here are some potential um, station locations indicated by the yellow pylons. Uh, these stations depend on partnerships. For example, in the photo on the right, on the top right, um, there are stations on the UPEI campus, but that will depend on if they will partner with us. But we are working on um, cost share agreements. Um, right. So the cost. Currently, the total estimated startup cost is approximately 607,000. Um, this includes the partner locations as well, which would not be paid for by the city. Um, the province of Prince Edward Island also committed up to 50% from the Active Transportation Fund. The fee structure would include a damage deposit, overage fees if um, the bicycle is not returned on time, um, and it's suggested that the first year there's a discount to incentivize the program. Um, this is just an example of a possible fee structure based on jurisdictions in North America and Europe, but to establish a more feasible fee structure, uh, we could have surveys and determine interest in the program. All bicycles will conform to the Highway Traffic Act um, for power assisted bicycles. Safety approved helmets are proposed to be available for rent at City Hall, Town Hall in Stratford and at partner locations. And here are some potential partners that I've reached out to um, and we're also considering having private partnerships later on. The next steps include sending out an RFP, um, working on partner cost share agreements, station location finalization, fee structure finalization, and a campaign man management strategy. That's all. Oh. Oh yeah, that's all. Yeah, thank you. There's a lot to digest here. Um, very informative. I think there's uh, a lot of um, a lot of people are excited about the program, and, and 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 that's what this is. What we're discussing here today is the program itself, and the program, as I understand it. Uh, Donna, is the program is initiated and facilitated by this respective department, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So this, Sophie is a seasonal staff person who worked with Public Works, and she worked with Scott Adams um, over the past summer, and they worked together on this proposal that you see. It has already gone to the Public Works Committee, and it was recommended that it come to Environment and Sustainability. So... So is this program? It was initiated by Public Works. Initiated by Public Works, but I thought all cycling and bicycling, electric bikes, whatever the case may be, was a mandate of this committee. I Somebody think it's probably. Some... No, no, it's not. I didn't know that. I thought cycling. Pardon me. 
we were told numerous times, this is one of the consulting committees, there's public works, there's environment sustainability, and there's parks and rec. Three of them will work together. At the end of the day, public works makes the recommendations. Well, then, I, I guess I'm going to look for a clarification. Maybe, Donna, you can get that from me later uh, about uh, who's the lead. I thought when we had, um, was it Jessica that was with us earlier? Um, you know, she, she was a member of this department and this committee. So there is, I'm, I'm somewhat confused. I thought we were the lead committee when it comes to cycling, uh, cycling uh, initiatives and, and programs. So Donna, I will ask for uh, clarification on that. Um, but no, uh, Sophie, I want to thank you for your presentation. Is there any questions? Uh, Councilor Rivard. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> My voice is not, uh, is not good. I haven't got it back from the uh, shellfish festival yet. <laughs> Anyways, good presentation. Just a couple of quick questions for you. Um, is it normal for municipalities across Canada to be doing this program, or is this something that is kind of more a third party type idea? Um, I think in other jurisdictions in Canada, um, there are companies hired by the municipalities, like the cities, um, and they, they operate the programs. If that's your question. Yeah, will we, will we be doing the same or are we going to operate it as a municipality? So what we were suggesting is that we would um, contract a company to do the operations, yeah. Okay, next question, or my last question. I, I always, when I see the province of Prince Edward Island can fund up to 50%, I see the word can and up to. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a commitment from the province for 50% or again, can, can suggest that they cannot? And, and up to 50% suggest it could be, well, <laughs> you, you've shopped. Uh, you know, you go into a store and you see up to 50% off, and you, the things you like is 5% off. I can see that for okay, sure. Okay, that would be amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, great, great presentation, and I think, it, you know, it's a great step towards moving um, towards our, how we can engage our, people in the summer, I know the scooters and stuff around town, my kids were all excited to get in town to see if they could get on one and, and have a turn. So I think the more we can do to promote this and to encourage um, environment friendly ways to get around our city is great. I know when I attended a conference three years ago, Councillor Bernard and I were both at a conference and one of the sessions I attended, they did uh, something similar. It wasn't e-bikes, it was just regular bikes, but they had really engaged with the community, so seniors groups and different people to become involved and feel like part of the operating part. So I don't know if we can kind of use this as an opportunity to plug in with some of our community members too, but there's lots of ways you can work collaboratively and make people feel like part of this program which I think is great that's a great yeah that's a great suggestion yeah um, is there are we going to be partnering with someone from the private sector I believe there's someone in the private sector now in our city that is providing this service and um, has there any has there been any collaboration with that with that business owner, and how does this align with what he's doing, or does it? A business owner? Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure, I can I'm jump not in. sure if you're Sophie aware, but Frank McCochran, Frank McCracken has his own business, and he's. You know, he's been operational now for a number of months. Uh, you know, read uh, read reports on him in the media. <laughs> you just purchase from him, don't you? I don't think you do. Like, if we'd go out to b purchase bikes. He would be a vendor. He would sell us bikes. Okay, he's not involved with routes and all that kind of stuff. Okay. I'm, I'm sure he probably... Uh, Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to um, comment on what Sophie was saying, so the slide that's up there that says next step, so RFP, so that would go out for proposals for businesses to bid on being the, the vendor that we work with to provide that service. And so it would be stations of share, like it's like a bike share program, so they'd be stations set up with bicycles that the public can sign out, swipe their credit card, go for a bike ride and then take it back different you can drop it off at different stops around the city 
But so the, what Sophie's referring to as the RFP as the next step, that would be to solicit businesses to bid on that. Thank you. Just, uh, just to go back to what we were talking about, if you look on the terms of reference for public works, it, it clearly states that all multi-use pathway, multi pathway design, construction, and maintenance shall be the responsibility of public works and urban beautification in consultation with environment, sustainability, and parks and rec. Yeah, I'm referring to the program, I'm not talking about the venues itself. I'm referring to the program. Who, who um, rolls out the program? I'm talking about the program. This is a program that Sophie's talking about, correct? I'm talking about the e-bike program. I gotta press this button again. Uh, I want to thank you for being here. It's it's a uh, pretty ambitious uh, program, and uh, hopefully uh, our citizens will gravitate towards this new initiative, and uh, we'll see more people uh, using uh, e-bikes and and regular bikes as well. Make this city much more sustainable and less uh, dependent on um, fossil fuels. Thank you. I think we have, do we have to move this as approval as a committee to move this on to the next stage? Is that? Uh, I think it, is it going back to, if it's going back to public works, they can make the resolution all we have to do. You can resolve that you're in favor of the program. Yeah. Um, I think with Greg's questions answered, we'd be good too. It. And again, Donna, yeah. programming comes from this committee. Well, uh, you asked for clarification. Yeah, so please look into that. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to item C. Climate Sense Internship. Um, I, I can't pronounce the name. Can I... Yep, so we have Abhishek tuning in virtually to give that presentation, so um, he's just up on the screen right now. Am I good to go? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, please, yeah. go right ahead. Yeah. One greetings to Honorable Chair, Council Members, and personnel from the City of Charlottetown. My name is Abhishek, Abhishek Fokrel. I was the climate since intern for city of Charlottetown. Um, so I was, Climate Sense is a program between public and private sectors in PEI with UPEI, uh, helping build adoption capacity, both in the recently graduate students like me and, and the institution itself. So for the Climate Sense internship, I was tasked with three objectives. First, reviewing climate change impact and risks to one of cities infrastructures for which I looked at city sewer networks and secondly identifying areas of concern <laughs> researching resources and collecting baseline information so that we can have a hit so there can be a start for taking actions against the climate change and lastly integrating feedback and concerns from different city departments on climate change so for first of my review I looked at rainfall. How does rainfall affect city sewers? I know this is a big graph with a lot of numbers and uh, values, but I'd like you to just notice three colors, blue, green, and red. Blue is the amount of rainfall that falls at a particular day. Green is the amount of wastewater measured at the Charlottetown Pollution Control Plant. And red is the amount, uh, uh, amount within that flow that is estimated to be from the rainfall. So on a even on a typical system, we expect 30% of rain rainfall to go into the sewer systems. But during rainfall, we could see around this in a particular event on September 2 uh, last year, we saw something around 300% of that increased flow because of rainfall. So just trying to show one of the impacts of the changing climate to city infrastructures. For the second uh, 
second objective of identifying different areas of concern, I looked into climate change, uh, climate change infrastructure resilience options. Uh, so similarly, I looked into sewer inflow and infiltration, which I just explained before. I looked into stormwater management for public works, coastal hazard, something like storm surges and erosion, then what can be the effects and certain recommendation on post-tropical storms, what, uh, how heat wave and hot temperature can affect city of Charlottetown and how we can take a look at it. So a lot of my, this, uh, from this research, a lot of my resources and baseline information includes a lot of GIS maps, uh, uh, GIS maps, baseline data from rainfall, uh, GIS pictures from eroded, eroded uh, coastlines in public areas of Charlottetown, and different uh, uh, scientific and available data that can be used to build up to have adaptive mazes brought in into different cities' day-to-day <coughs> -day activities. So on the third note, I looked into feedback from different city departments. So, so from utilities, figure out that rainfall derived inflow infiltration, like when it rainfalls, we die. when the rain, where there is a precipitation, there is a lot of water going into the sewer network, which causing a lot of operational challenges for the utilities. Similarly, change in water quality and quantity can be a concern due to the changing climate. Uh, and last uh, but not least is the infrastructure resilience, since uh, utilities uh, they look after two of the public infrastructure of drinking water and wastewater system. There is a lot of impact on this due to the changing climate. For public works, uh, stormwater management was a big concern, uh, uh, identifying areas of uh, flooding, especially in and around Holland College and Grafton Street. Uh, uh, was one of them for uh, the big rainfall event last year. Similarly, repair and maintenance of roads and walkways, how climate change affect them, how the cost of these increases, how how we can um, kind of mitigate this problem. So I have mentioned certain recommendations and what's been uh, been doing around what's been done in and around Canada and over the world for this kind of problems. And finally, for forestry, Invasive species was one of the concerns and damage to tree and green spaces due to the changing climate, thunderstorms, post-tropical post -tropical storms, and uh, diseases were one of major concerns. And for this uh, particular, to, to implement this uh, climate change action process, action, so to, to implement this climate change findings, there are certain frameworks that I looked at. Uh, three of the mentions are asset management, climate, climate resiliency. So using climate uh, resiliency approach in asset management can be one of the uh, ways to implement this. Second can be climate lens. Uh, it's an approach from Infrastructure Canada, where we look at any given project through climate lens looking at how the climate is going to affect uh, the project and how the project is going to affect to the changing climate or can can call it, can be vulnerable to the environment and last but not the least is the public infrastructure uh, vulnerability engineering vulnerability protocol which is an engineering protocol used uh, usually for uh, engineering designs that needs to be engineering designs of public infrastructures like drinking water system, wastewater system, roads and walkways. Uh, and yep. And so some of the recommendations is, I know this lot of this, uh, my research, my lot of my internship was interdepartmental and I worked a lot with utilities, public works and forestry, but all in all, I think the environment and sustainability group is taking a lead on starting and identifying and gathering information on the changing climate so that we can put forward values, values like how, how much it does it cost to treat extra water in the sewer system or something like this to show the impact of climate change in terms of numbers, in terms of cost values, in, cost of, in, in, in case of losses. So once we get these values, we want to quantify, I think the next steps should be quantifying the effect of the climate change and 
comparing it with a no action policy how much does it how much is the loss due to the changing climate to a particular infrastructure and what is the cost if we don't take any actions and finally after this analysis going to implementation and mitigation and using adaptation plans to type to work for, against climate change i think i'm brief on that so thank you very much for the opportunity and i think i'm ready to take in the questions well thank you for your uh, analysis your assessment and all the uh, very important research that you've uh, conducted uh, thus far. Thus far. Um, um, I think I'll open it up I'll by uh, asking about your stormwater management, <coughs> flooding. You referenced Grafton Street. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if you got uh, that information from Public Works. I think you did say you collaborated with Public Works. Uh, did Public Works indicate to you the troublesome area of Queen Street between Reserve and Pond Street and how any type of rain surge uh, that happens in our city that uh, this particular neighborhood is under siege in terms of flooding up to four or five feet and it's very problematic for the residents that live in that particular neighborhood in that community and uh, Again, that's very troublesome. So my question to you is, uh, did you take that under consideration as well as one of the major, major uh, challenges in our city when it comes to flooding? So uh, I didn't look, uh, pardon me, Chair, I didn't look into the very specific part, but on general, what I noticed through my assessment was a lot of the outlet for stormwater is natural creeks and flow area that are natural to the uh, that are spread around city of Charlottetown. So a lot of these area that that uh, that has uh, that uh, has this flooding issues uh, has has a very say has a blocked natural drainage or very low areas like a ball. It's surrounded by higher lands and there is no scape of water, especially from the surface of people houses or uh, from from roads or parking lots. So a natural sloping area or something like that w would be one of the recommendation. So I did look into specific into Grafton Street, and I realized there is not a uh, that is one of the watershed that doesn't have any natural outlet to the sea. The only one might be an in-ground uh, stormwater system pipeline, which opens up near the bridge and which can be underwater during storm events. So I think that can be one of the issues. Um, please put Queen Street on your radar. I'd like that looked at as well to see what the options are to alleviate that, uh, yep. that pressure whenever we have a, a rain surge, a rain event uh, in our city. And of course, with the anticipated uh, uh, storm coming this weekend, uh, you can get a real good snapshot if you get down there personally and experience it. I'll, I'll be there. I'm there every time there's a rain surge, and uh, it's very problematic for our, for the residents that are living there. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Um, just a couple, um, Councillor, if I could. One, um, I was under the, actually, to, to your point, I was under the understanding that the uh, storm sewers down that area, when they put them in, when they, when they ran them out for where the water releases, when the tide is high, yep. that water can't get out. That's why yes. you have the flooding. Um, but I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm reading some of the things in, in the report, and I assume that um, this information that we're seeing in the graphs is after our storm and sewer has been separated. We have a, we have a, Storm yes, and sewer used to be together in one system, and it's been since separated. So, is this information up to date? Yes, sir. That the particular graph in that report is from last year, the rainfall of 126 mm for September 2, 2021. Right. So, I don't think we've had any. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Don. I don't know if you know. I don't think we've had any uh, incidents into the Hillsborough River because of overflows. 
since we've had, since the session's been been. I don't know, Councillor. I'd yeah. have to check that. I, I, it seems to me I'd have to check that. Because yeah. we had notes from our, our our manager this year that there's uh, there's been no overflows, and this is oh. the first year we've had the storm, sewer, and water separated. Uh, it, and that was the idea of spending that kind of money on it. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly was. Yeah. And, and the note from our manager, I think, said that, uh, I think there was two of them. One was the first time we didn't have the oyster fishery yes. closed. Yeah. That was on July 15th. And then when we had the incident, when we had the accident down on Water Street, there was an overflow there. It wasn't caused by rain. It was caused by the accident. Right. But it was the, but we all learned a lot from that and that, um, there's a certain amount of inflow of flow into the water before we even know it. But right. this we, year we, has been so good. This yeah, year it's from, yeah, I'm just seeing here that Charlottetown needs to uh, a much higher budget uh, to perform low flow camera analysis and excavation if required. And I'm just wondering, well, we've already done a whole new system. I, I think that uh, I think as the as the gentleman spoke of, um, and and correct me if I'm if I'm not correct here when you said it. We took all that water that was going to the treatment plant and we diverted that. But there's still other waterways that we still have to deal with, i.e. the Spring Park one that Councillor Tweel is talking about. Like the water from Spring Park doesn't go down and go out, go out through the treat, go out through um, pit, the the one down at, at uh, in front of the. <laughs> In like my arms going here. <laughs> uh, right. In front, in the front of the culinary. Yeah, in front of the culinary yeah. institute. Like the water from up there doesn't go to the culinary institute. Uh, the water from Grafton Street doesn't go to the culinary institute. When we did, when we separated the 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 storm from the from the sewer, that was to address the issue of pro, of us treating the storm water in the plant as opposed to uh, what we should be treating in the plant. So we, we took all of the water out of, we had a combined sewer system. So we had sewer and storm running through the same pipes to the plant being treated. We set another set of pl plants and uh, pipes and diverted the storm um, so that the only going, affluent going to the plant is, out, is, is sewer as opposed right. to sewer and storm. But that's, that. Um, that's not the whole city. There are other waterways, like the Spring Park one, um, and that actually—it's not even the Spring. That's what they call it. But um, uh, the, there's the Grafton Street one. There, I think there's three or four in the city. Delgiz and those yeah. areas that were underwater before yes. that they yes. filled and in. Yes, and out yeah. there in that rain, the Spring Spring Park. But spring. I think the whole idea, Donna, was to take the storm water. And the storm sewer, all that flow heading to the treatment plant was to take the storm water out and just have the yep. treat, have the yep. no, sanitary. That's what we did. Right. So the sanitary goes to the treatment plant, which yep. reduces storm water from going to the treatment plant, causing overflows. Yeah. So I'm assuming the storm water goes out into. Yeah. But where it was not, uh, I guess, <laughs> I'm not making myself clear, where it was not combined. We right. Had a, right. Where it was, yeah. where. That's those still are have there's still inf infiltration in those areas, I think is what the internal is saying during the during a, a rain event. Yeah, so I don't think the city plans on taking storm water to the treatment plant. No, no, no. So that's no. what I think what he's talking about is storm water. Yeah, well, no, and what I'm talking about is storm water, but I'm not suggesting that storm water be shipped to the treatment plant. No, I know. What I'm suggesting is that new infrastructure be installed to address that overflow that the residents in that particular community experiences. Every time there's a rain event, it's a very narrow street, and the uh, water rises up higher than this desk, and then the result is the water goes into people's homes and damages their properties. And uh, they're under tremendous anxiety and fear whenever an, an event is, is being announced as a storm, an anticipated storm coming. Uh, we, we, we go through this dilemma every time, and it's very troublesome, it's very problematic, and it's damaging to the, to the people that live in that community. So um, I'm uh, looking for viable solutions to try to combat uh, that, that, that rain surge and, and have some predictability and calmness 
for the residents that live in that community. Right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No? Um, I, sir, I want to thank you. This is a tremendous report. Uh, I think we're going to be referencing this report in the months and, 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 and the years to come, and hopefully uh, we can uh, start working at uh, some of the, some of, some of the uh, issues and recommendations that you've identified. A very sincere thank you for the great work that you've done. <coughs> thank, you. thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. Oh, our next item is cosmetic pesticides. Katrina, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So this report is intended to be our annual update on the Cosmetic Pesticide Bylaw Administration, as well as a follow-up from our last meeting where we were discussing some of the changes that Cornwall has made in terms of the implementation of their bylaw. Um, so I'll start just by saying that um, this year, the city received 146 applications for exception to the Cosmetic Pesticide Bylaw. Um, this is substantially down from past years. Um, as you'll see in the report, last year we received 274. Um, this seems to have been the trend across the board. I spoke with Stratford as well. They also saw a record low this year. We're not exactly sure why, but it's likely due to the weather. Um, it seems to be, you know, the weather greatly affects the way that um, these pests operate. So um, that's our hypothesis. Um, of those, 145 were related to chinch bugs, and one was for Dutch elm disease, and all applications were approved. So as you all know, the, there's a $50 fee associated with an application to exception for this bylaw, so for applicator companies to apply to the city to apply pesticides in the case of an infestation. Um, and as follow-up from last time, we were discussing that Cornwall has removed this $50 fee. Um, both Cornwall and Stratford have, have comparable bylaws to what we have. Um, and previous to this, all three municipalities charged that $50 fee. So uh, at this committee's request, we looked into what was behind that decision-making for Cornwall. Um, in discussing this with their staff, um, it turned out that, so they generally receive very few applications, so 35 to 40 at most. Yep, most, yep, most, yep, most, yep, most, yep, most. <laughs> um, and I think that that's a high year for them. Um, and they've also observed very high compliance with um, their bylaw. Um, and they find that because they have limited staff capacity, um, the administrative processes behind executing the bylaw um, take up a lot of time and effort. Um, with the funds that we generally um, take in from the bylaw, we're able to hire additional staff to support, but I don't believe that they are. Um, and they've also received complaints from residents regarding the fees. So all of these together led them to instead move to a data collection model. So moving forward, the town requires that the pesticide applicator companies alert the town prior to spraying the pesticides, um, but they do not require approval and they don't have to pay the fee, and then that data is tracked. The town does reserve the right to um, do an inspection at any time for any reason, though. And if the bylaw were to be contravened, they would still um, get involved. Um, I'll also note that in accompaniment to the removal of the fee, the town implemented um, a green lawn rebate program. So the program provides rebates for the rental or purchase of equipment that homeowners can use to naturally take care of their lawn and prevent um, pest infestations. Uh, so just to sort of round out our information, I did also speak to staff at the town of Stratford, um, who is continuing to charge that $50 fee for exception. They did actually receive a request from one of the applicator companies this early in the summer in June to remove that $50 fee, um, and town council voted against it. So moving forward, they will be maintaining their $50 fee. Um, I'd also just like to note that um, that this fee operates under what we call, or like the um, polluter pays principle. So basically, um, it is a common practice um, across the country for various things, and um, non-domestic cosmetic pesticides are noxious substances, and they do harm the environment in many ways. Um, and the fee, as I said, the fee associated with um, exception to the bylaw allows us to hire additional staff in the summer to implement the bylaw, but in addition to the inspections that they conduct in the administrative work, it's also allowed them to take, um, undertake educational efforts to try and reduce the um, need for pesticide use. 
Um, so with that, I will just say that it's the recommendation of city staff to leave our $50 fee in place. Okay, uh, just, just before you go, Julie, did you want to uh, say anything regarding this? I know you sent me an email back a number of months ago. You wanted this on the agenda. So uh, you recall? Um, Gosh, I don't recall that. So I do. So oh. uh, did you Good. want, since you wanted it on the agenda, was there any, any questions or any concerns that you wanted to address to Katrina? No, I think she did a lot of, I, think, I know she was asked by this committee to go and, and look at what other municipalities were doing. It sounds like you did a really thorough job of that, and I'm okay with continuing to maintain the $50 fee. Uh, any other member of the committee have any questions or any concerns? Going once, going twice, going three times, no. Our next agenda item is the switch Thank you, thank you for, for, for coming. Program update, very exciting switch program update. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, as you folks are aware, uh, the switch program has been going on for over a year now, and this is just a quick update to bring you up to speed what has happened so far uh, since we last met. Uh, so we have had 645 homeowners show interest in the program uh, who actively wanted to participate in the program. Of course, uh, once, uh, so once people hear about all that w which is required, uh, not all of them come through. We, to date, we have 310 agreements that translate to 4.5, approximately $4.5 million worth of projects. Uh, out of which 124, 124 projects are in progress, valuing around $1.9 million. Uh, so one thing interesting which uh, came out of this program is that PEI has the highest number of energy audited houses in any province in Canada. Um, I'm not saying this program is the main reason for it, but this program does play a big significant part in it where uh, everyone going through this program, the first step they need to do is get a home energy audit done. Uh, we are slowly resuming marketing efforts for uh, this program and uh, we talk a little bit about it towards the end. Uh, we we want to maintain it in a way so that our administrative st staff is e able to accommodate all the residents while uh, not overburdening them uh, kind of thing. So to date, uh, out of those total projects, uh, this is a quick breakdown of all the different uh, projects people have done. Heat pumps being highest, followed by solar uh, projects, insulation, other uh, projects, and then windows and doors. When I say other projects, it includes geothermal heating, boiler replacement, hybrid electric water heaters as well. Uh, next up in figure two, you could see the committed amount of money and the completed amount of money. It's a beautiful chart which shows how the uptake of the program has uh, come along since we have uh, started. And as you could see, February 2022, we kicked off quite, quite a bit and since then we are not slowing down. Um, a case study was done uh, on a resident of uh, the SWITCH program uh, where the resident went uh, through uh, the program and got some home insulation done and a heat pump installed. Uh, and the results showed that there were 150 greenhouse uh, gigajoules of green uh, saved, which was approximately $7,207 of home energy saved on an annual basis. Uh, this, uh, the, the results of it also showed that 10.3 uh, tons of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions were reduced on an annual basis. That's equivalent of 40, approximately 41, uh, 41,000 kilometers of a average gas powered car being removed from the streets. Uh, it, it is a great case study. Um, uh, if someone wants a little more detail, more than this paragraph, feel free to reach out to me after the meeting and I would be more than happy to send it over to you. Uh, marketing and communication, last but not least, 
so we're uh, planning to do an in-person session uh, for contractors uh, to help the contractors with this project, uh, sorry, not project, with this program, because we're seeing that contracts, new contractors are coming on board and they need to be trained how to properly navigate through the program to achieve the efficiency PEI mark and the city of Charlottetown mark uh, while maintaining the federal uh, grant opportunities for the residents. Um, we are planning to do a few educational um, um, boots or online events, uh, which are mainly going to be focusing on a heat pump this time. We previously did solar uh, PV education. Now we're going to focus a little bit more on heat pumps because with the rising prices of oil and winter approaching really fast, uh, that is something which a lot of our residents uh, in Charlottetown could benefit from. Uh, other than that, Pace Atlantic CIC has hired um, a green energy marketing specialist. Um, so they're going to be working on creating some social media posts about education. And once our communication team is fully uh, functional, th those are going to be posted on our social media platforms. That was just a quick summary of uh, what has happened so far. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you, Iman, for... Uh, uh, for the latest uh, status report, very informative. Obviously, a lot of our residents in our city are participating, and uh, it's not, as you pointed out, it's not slowing down. Uh, I think it's exciting, and uh, I think this sets the, uh, the foundation for years to come. So I can see this program <coughs> expanding more participation, and I, I, I even see more uh, more attributes being introduced in, into this program. I, I think the, the work you've done thus far is phenomenal, and uh, there's a lot of testimony out in our community, uh, people that are excited about this program. I'll open up the floor for any questions from our committee members. Go ahead, Thank Dan. you. Um, I'm on. Just wondering, um, I know you mentioned this last month, I'm trying to remember, like whenever we kicked into phase two for the funding, so how much, what, what is the total funding that we have allocated towards this? Okay, I, I'm just gonna quickly open this. I just sent this over to Jessica a few minutes ago. Um, okay, so we have had two disbursements so far. The first disbursement was around 900,000. Uh, and there was a grant portion of 800,000. Second disbursement, which we have received, was ar around $1.4 million, and the grant portion of 232,000. Uh, and then we're looking forward to a third disbursement, which is gonna be approximately $1.8 million. Um, so in total, it's gonna be around uh, around 10 million. Yeah, that's not, so, we're, so right now, it looks like we're at four and a half million dollars. Yes. Not necessarily. So you know how I mentioned in first disbursement and second disbursement, there were grant portions and then there were loan portions. So the grant portion cannot be used towards giving uh, residents loans. Uh, that could only be used uh, to, for the function functional part of the program. Example, we've used the grant portion to waive out the 100 $99 home energy audit fees. Uh, we've used it towards, a, uh, hire, we're in the process of hiring an administrative assistant who is located in the city. Uh, a little bit of my salary goes through it. So a little bit of in-kind hours and a mix of stuff can be uh, powered through the grant portion, but it cannot be given as long. This is from FCM, not from us. So Armand, do you know what's left in the grant portion? Ballpark? Not on the top of my head. You can't ballpark again. I, I cannot. I could get you uh, get okay. you numbers if you need me to. Uh, so most of it most of it is the loan part of the program. Most of the funding. Yes. Okay. Yeah. If I can get that breakdown another time, that'd be great. For sure. Thank you. Um, and uh, just to add to that, um, 
we once we run out of this money, um, uh, Stratford and uh, sorry, Stratford and our third partner were successful in getting an extra disbursement uh, on top of what the, what was already allocated for them uh, at zero percent interest. So, if not if when we run out, uh, my intention is that the city should reapply for the same amount uh, for at zero percent to continue giving the residents a zero percent interest uh, opportunity. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Staff? Donna? Soup? No? Okay. Thank you once again. And uh, look further to uh, uh, future updates and, and more involvement and participation from residents in our city. This is a great program, and uh, there's been a lot of enthusiasm since it f was first introduced, so congratulations. Um, I did ask for a couple of items to be put on the agenda. Uh, one is regarding bus shelters. Um, do we have an update as to if new bus shelters have been ordered? Uh, we do. Uh, you know, we've, we've ordered new buses, but in terms of uh, bus shelters, I, I certainly have a request uh, for, uh, you know, two senior homes that would like a, a bus shelter. Uh, and, of course, we're going to need bus shelters for St. Peter's Road and some of the new routes that we're looking to uh, uh, bring on stream. So have, have we entered, have we ordered new bus shelters? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we do not currently have budget allocated for bus shelters in this year's capital. So if we want to purchase bus shelters in the future, we'll have to add that to our next budget request. And um, I have a spreadsheet started when I receive requests because what Ramona shared with me is that it's much more affordable to buy them in bulk as opposed to one-offs here and there. So the recommendation was that we collect a bunch of requests for bus shelters and send that out for bids collectively when we have budget approved for that. Right now we have no budget for that. Um, I also think we would need to look at recommendations and requests from across the city and look at where we're putting them. Um, right now, to my knowledge, we don't have a plan for where we need shelters. I only have the one request you mentioned documented, but I'm sure there's others. Um, so short answer is we would have to look at it for next fiscal year. Uh, if I might add, it might be a good idea, you know, you know, when, when it's, when we do have a budget for it, talking to TC, T3, Definitely. see what they recommend since they drive the buses and they pick the people all up, so we'll see what they're recommending for bus shelters. Thanks. Um, well, we do have an idea of where the new bus routes are going to go, um, and, and, and we have requests for uh, bus shelters on, on St. Peter's Road as well. Um, so. Like, do we have to wait for the budget in order to, to order, in order, can we not, uh, I don't know, can we not, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, I know we have to have money to buy them, but can we not uh, work with uh, the operator? I mean, we're looking at adding new routes. We're going to have to have new bus shelters. Um, the residents are requesting them. Do we have to wait another, you know, six months or another year before, by the time you order the bus shelters and by the time they arrive, I mean, you're talking another year. Can we not do anything to ex expedite the process? Um, you know, there's a real need for these bus shelters. Uh, people are requesting them. People with, uh, and I might add, people with mo mobility issues, people that are finding it very difficult to, to, uh, you know, especially when, you know, this time of the year or in the winter months, they, uh, they find it very, very difficult. So they would like to have those bus shelters to at least shelter the wind and the snow and the hail and everything else that goes with it. So is there any, Don, Don is there anything we can do? Mr. Uh, Chair, we don't have a budget and, you know, there's just no, there's no money and we know we're going to be over budget this year already in the transit. 
because I mean we've just put through a resolution for an additional one hundred and forty thousand dollars for transit subsidy fuel. I expect we'll be back here in November with looking for more money for more service hours. Um, <clears throat> so it's uh, you know like there is no budget. We've heard before that there is a uh, there there will be a need for more transit sh shelters, but I think I it, there is no budget for it right now and to. I, you know, we're, our fingers have been slapped before and, and maybe slapped again for spending money that we don't have. No, I just wonder if there's any con contingency funding here in City Hall, whether it's this, through this uh, committee, this department, or any other department. I mean, there's a real need for these bus shelters. And again, I'm sure there's plans on, on the books for adding new routes. Again, I bring your attention St. Peter's Road. So that was the next item that I uh, asked to be put on the agenda. Where are we at with the new routes? Uh, you know, I've, I've read in the media where residents throughout the city are requesting more routes, uh, you know, different times uh, to be able to accommodate the different neighborhoods and communities throughout the city of Charlottetown. Can, can someone give me a status report as to where we're at uh, with those, uh, those particular requests and, and where we're at with these new routes? And, if I could, just before you go there, though, I think I'd like to add, um, if recollection, my recollection is correct, <clears throat> the budget was being prepared. I think there was an expectation of money coming from the provincial government in around the 400000 area, which never materialized. But it was added to our budget with expectations. So I do think that the province plays a role in this, too, in our transit system and, and funding towards the transit system. And I think that's probably a, a call or... Uh, a meeting should be held with the provincial government to see uh, uh, what expectations the city can have in funding coming towards the transit program. Okay, that's a good point. And uh, uh, maybe I'll follow up on that. On, um, that. on that point, I've met with, we've met with uh, the, the three municipalities, the three CAOs, the Transit Coordinating Committee has met with the Deputy Minister on that matter just two months ago, I would say, maybe. And, you know, $450,000, I think, was put in the budget with the expectation that we would receive that. Uh, and there was a high expectation that we would re receive it. We were told after we passed the budget that we would get the $180,000 that we've been getting since 2005, to, uh, almost 20 years ago. The same, that's the same subsidy operating budget. So the three municipalities have, request, have, have met with the deputy minister, I don't know the la I think there was a meeting with the minister, with the mayors, was there? Uh, I, I believe the mayors met with the minister and transit funding was on their agenda at, at one point in time. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the details on that. The last I heard from Ramona was that yes, they had gone together to the province and asked for an increase in the provincial subsidy and it was declined even though it sounded like they were very much believing that they were going to get that money to the point where they put it included it in their budgets. Yeah. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a summary here. <laughs> so the city of Charlottetown, correct me if I'm wrong, put four hundred fifty thousand dollars in the budget, right, for new routes, new sh new um, just, just operating. Yep. Yeah. Revenue. Actually, we put one hundred eighty. Expected four hundred. So we. Okay, so we did not put four hundred fifty thousand. Okay, so we put we did put Donna, we did put four hundred fifty thousand in the budget, correct? Okay, so we went to the province, asking for their financial assistance as well, right? No, we didn't. Okay, we went jointly with Stratford and Cornwall. Before we put the money in the budget. Okay, before we put the money in the budget. And, and the province is, sta is remaining status quo of 180000 All right. That was with the deputy minister. Uh, no, I think it was... Sorry. I, 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 think, I think it was at the elected... They, they went, they asked for the money. The indication is that they were going to get the money. So we put the money in our budget. The pro the yeah, yeah, and we did not get it. They, they then came back after we did our budget. We did not get it. So the city is having to 
and we balanced our budget, the transit budget, with that $450,000, of which we did not receive 240000 of it. So we are, we are in the hole before we, this budget is in the hole before it starts. And now we've just asked for another $140,000 for the purpose of um, uh, the fuel transit, uh, fuel, fuel subsidy. So this budget, and then I expect we're going to be back to you in November-ish saying we need more service hours on the new routes. Um, we, these are the proposed new routes to, to facilitate what's going on in the city. We need more service hours. I imagine we'll be back, and that will be new money as well in order to accommodate what's going on on the buses right now. Thank you, Donna. Well, maybe we can, uh, maybe we can set up a meeting with the minister to see if, in fact, we can, uh, lobby and, and, and talk about how important it is that uh, we receive more funding. I mean, if, if we're not there at the table pounding the drum, then we're not going to get more money. I mean, the status quo is not an option, obviously. It's just not an option. So what about the federal government? Where are they at in this, e in this equation? They do not give any money for operating there just to the capital. So we are in partnership with the province and the cap and the feds for the purchase of the electric buses and um, all that type of thing. But they do not do operating. Right. So, so the pro province does help out with the operational, but again, once again, it's status quo. Status quo for 20 years, 18 years. Well, I think we need to uh, maybe come at it a different way. Uh, nonetheless, anyway, we'll, we'll we'll have to pursue that. And the other uh, item I asked to be put on the agenda was active transportation pathways. Um, I know this committee is instrumental in the uh, pathway along uh, Riverside Drive. Um, there's more requests for p active transportation pathways, and I'd like to see this committee become more involved in the uh, identifying pathways. Uh, um, I think that there's a big demand in our community, and maybe maybe it should be a separate entity onto itself. So that's why I wanted to touch on it briefly here today. I know I'm getting tremendous pressure for the one on uh, on Towers Road and and in the heart of the city. We we need to uh, we need to be looking at active transportation pathways throughout the old city of Charlottetown. I know we've done a lot of work on the periphery of the city, but we need to be looking at uh, pathways in, in, the, in, the, in the downtown area uh, in through, uh, you know, University Avenue, Queen Street, uh, I'd say Kensington Road, North River Road. We, we need to be looking at, uh, at, uh, at uh, future potential pathways throughout the city. And I, I think, Your Worship, uh, or Your Worship, Mr. Chair, um, and this was all discussed before, and they come up with a five-year plan. So there's a five-year plan right now for multi-purpose pathways in the city of Charlotte now, and that was passed by council. That was a guide. That's a guide. That's you what call it was, what you want, but there's no, a five-year that, plan. No, that's the way it was sold. I know, but, yeah, yeah. but guide, plan, whatever. But yeah, I mean, guide. People are it was looking a guide. for a five-year plan. Yeah, it was a, so, well, the way it was sold at council was a guide. doesn't matter. There's a five-year plan in place for multi-purpose pathways. Well, council can change that at any time. They can. Yeah. They can, yeah, that's, that's, that's but we, we, we did pass it, so council would have to rescind it to, to, to pass a new one. No, you can make additions to it. You can make, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Can yeah. So, I mean, you know, that, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people who are looking for multi-purpose pathways yeah, right. with, throughout the city of Charlotte. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of pressure on it, and I think the, the city's doing the best that it can, and that's why there's a five-year plan put ahead, as opposed to every year trying to argue where these plans are going. Wow. So. Yeah, but there's an urgency with, with some of these particular... There, there is an urgency. There, there is, depending... Yeah, there is. You know, every councillor has urgencies in his ward. And, I mean, oh, I, this I, is an urgency for you, so you're pushing it for your ward. Uh, but the plan... Urgency for set. the community. It's an urgency for the community, Councillor Bernard. For the city of Charlottetown. Yes, yeah, it is. For the community. For every yeah. community. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, think, I think we do need to rethink active transportation pathways. Um, you know, there's a five-year plan to do streets and sidewalks and all those other things. That's what I looked at with that particular plan, and the way it was sold to council, it was, it's a guide. 
it's more a, a guide, and you can add, you can delete, you can make you amendments. Can. You, yeah, you can, you can. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I want to take it a step further, and, and I would like to see active transportation pathways as an entity onto itself so that uh, we can even put more emphasis, more resources, and make it a priority for the city of Charlottetown and, and for some of the communities that truly need it. Um, uh, you know, if we're, we're talking, we talked earlier about uh, about uh, public e programming and uh, cycling and, and whatnot. So, you know, whatever we can do to expedite the process, that's our job. Our job here is to lobby for those uh, for those initiatives. So, I wanted to bring that forward. And uh, Donna, I think we need to have further discussions on that. Jessica. I'll just add a couple of comments. So the city does have a regional active transportation plan where we worked with Cornwall and Stratford on that. And I think it's about a decade old now. So I know when Ramona left, um, there was a suggestion that we revisit that. I think the plan that Councillor Bernard's referring to is, is an internal city public works guiding document, whereas there is also a larger document looking at park connections, um, other municipality connections, and that kind of thing. So I think it's both. I think it's obviously Public Works has their five-year plan, but we also need to look at the larger scope of where these pathways are, and um, I think we need to revitalize that plan. So I would say in the future, I don't know when, we pr probably will come forward to this committee and recommend that we update that regional active tra transportation plan. But that would have been part of the process that they used to come up with the five-year plan, the internal one we have. They did look at the regional plan also. Yes. Yeah. It sounds like what was outlined in that regional plan is pretty much accomplished, such as like the Hillsborough Bridge connection and the Riverside Drive connection. I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you for your participation. And I look forward to uh, furthering uh, the agenda items that are here and the additional agenda items. Thank you very much.